Hello, I'm Jeremy Strick, director of the Nasher Sculpture Center. Welcome to day two of the Nasher Prize Dialogues Graduate Symposium, this year dedicated to the work of the 2020 Nasher Prize laureate, Michael Rakowitz. While the symposium is usually hosted here in Dallas at the Nasher Sculpture Center, due to the unique circumstances of the pandemic, this year we are hosting it virtually. But the virtual format allows students from around the country and Europe to present their papers, as well as more people to watch and participate in the program than ever before. We're delighted that so many of you will get to learn more about the compelling work of Michael Rakowitz. I want to express gratitude to the many generous sponsors of this event. Marguerite Hoffman and Thomas Lentz, Elizabeth Redleaf, Alana and Adrian Sada, Albertino Cisneros and Juan Pascual, and Lisa Dawson and Thomas Morstead. Thank you for making it possible for us to further the academic research on this remarkable artist. Today, we will hear from graduate students Eliza Harrison from Williams College and Ava Hess from the University of California, Los Angeles. And steering the conversation over the next three days will be Dr. Nada Shabut, an expert on the work of Michael Rakowitz, as well as a close friend of the artist. Nada Shabut is a professor of art history and the coordinator of the Contemporary Arab and Muslim Cultural Studies Initiative at the University of North Texas, Denton, Texas, USA. She is the founding president of the Association for Modern and Contemporary Art from the Arab World, Iran, and Turkey. Shabut was the project advisor for the Saudi National Pavilion, Venice Biennale 2019. She is the author of Modern Arab Art, Formation of Arab Aesthetics, co-editor with Salwa Migdadi of New Vision, Arab Art in the 21st Century, and co-editor of Modern Art in the Arab World, Primary Documents. Shabut has been curator of many exhibitions and the recipient of various awards, including the Presidential Excellency Award, University of North Texas, the American Academic Research Institute in Iraq Fellowship, MIT Visiting Assistant Professor, and Fulbright Senior Scholar Program. Dr. Shabut, thank you so much for your dedication to the 2020 Nasher Prize Graduate Symposium, and thanks to all for the watching. Welcome, everyone. It is good to see you again on our second panel. Our um, panel, our speakers for today will be speaking on the topic of how museums and contemporary artists handle cultural destruction and loss. We have two papers for the day. Our first paper is presented by Eliza Harrison, who is an independent artist and art historian and teacher living in Brooklyn, New York. Her paper is on the culture of loss in the digital age. Michael Rakowitz's The Invis Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist and the Politics of Reconstruction. I'll have Eliza, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for the introduction, Nada, and I will share my screen. Thanks also to everyone at the Nasher for making this event possible and for everyone in the audience who I can't see, but I can feel your presence. All right, so without further ado, as long as this is up, um, I'll begin. A video taken of Michael Rakowitz working on his ongoing series, The Invisible Enemy Should Not Exist, shows the artist and an assistant in the midst of reconstructing the famous Varka vase, an ancient Sumerian stone vessel stolen from the National Museum of Iraq in Baghdad during the US invasion in 2003. Behind the in-process reconstruction hang blown up black and white images of the original vase, a three foot tall object carved completely in alabaster some 5,000 years ago in the ancient city of Uruk. The enlarged photographs reveal that the original vase was carved with four registers of detailed relief decorations that display from top to bottom, a cultic scene of the ruler of Uruk making an offering to the temple of the goddess Inanna men carrying offerings, sheep, and plants. 
Though trained as a stone sculptor, Rakowitz has chosen strikingly different materials in which to reappear the vase, which was eventually returned to the museum in 14 broken pieces several months after it was stolen. The new vase's body is shaped with cardboard and its intricate registers are painstakingly paper mache with Arabic newspapers and Middle Eastern food packaging that stand in as stone carvings. In order to aid him with this material translation, Rakowitz has cut out the various figures and objects from the photographs and pasted them onto the new cardboard vase. In the video, he holds a green and red scrap of packaging up to a bundle of reeds in the top register, pausing in deliberation before moving it up, then down, to see if it might look better somewhere else. As they work, Rakowitz and his assistant appear to consult one another, conferring and considering with shakes and nods, or perhaps they are just chatting. Rakowitz remarks on the conversational potential of the project, stating, there was this war that none of us could do anything about, which we couldn't stop, and there was something about the slowness about making this work that allowed for a conversation space to open up where we were actually discussing the war. This image of time consuming and communal art making using materials meticulously worked by hand directly links Rakowitz's artistic pro process to craft traditions. As art historian Bib Bibiana Obler argues in her essay, Craft as a Response to War, Rakowitz's unique materials crucially distinguish the new objects from the destroyed or stolen originals. In addition to the purposeful material disjuncture between old and new object, the slow and exacting handicraft that goes into fabricating each sculpture renders the project temporally unsustainable when faced with the thousands of antiquities lost during the Iraq war. In reference to the invisible enemy, Obler concludes, craft's value as a response to war lies in the way that it can make painfully manifest its own inadequacy and yet signal an effort to keep trying. Implicit in Obler's observation is a connection between durational craft work and the unending process of grappling with des destroyed cultural heritage and memory. Looking more closely at this implication, I hope to clarify the role that Rakowitz's materials and process play in creating a necessarily ongoing and incomplete archive of loss founded on crafted assemblage, seriality, and material engagement. What began as paper mache and cardboard reconstructions of artifacts stolen or destroyed during the Iraq war has since grown to include a reconstruction of a stone statue Lamassu that originally guarded the gates of Nineveh, seen here on the left, and reproductions of the reliefs in the Northwest Palace of Nimrud, a section of which is pictured on the right. These continuing iterations express the impossibility of ever creating a complete index of the objects displaced destroyed or stolen due to war and imperialism in the Middle East. Yet the never ending nature of the project simultaneously demonstrates Rakowitz's commitment to this complex act of cultural restoration. The artist's choice to use fragile, cast off and contemporary materials in an intentionally labor intensive and ongoing process sharply contrasts with many other current efforts to recreate destroyed archeological objects and sites. In the past two decades, the Iraq war, the upsurge of the Islamic State and the ongoing Syrian civil war have given rise to a proliferation of cultural heritage projects that attempt to recreate destroyed artifacts using immersive digital technology. Putting the invisible enemy should not exist in conversation with several digital projects illuminates the central role that Rakowitz's materials and process play in creating a purposefully fragile and incomplete archive of absence. Rather than papering over the ruptures of cultural erasure with a literalist replacement, with literalist replacements, Rakowitz uses simultaneously disposable and meaningful materials in a deliberately accumulative process to create reappearances that never reconcile with their originals, but instead make visible the ongoing process of understanding cultural loss. ISIS is not only beheading individuals, it is tearing out the fabric of whole civilizations. For the proud people of Iraq and Syria, ancient civilizations, civilizations of great beauty, great accomplishment, of extraordinary history and intellectual achievement, 
the destruction of their heritage is a purposeful final insult. These words were spoken by former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry at a news conference hosted by UNESCO and the State Department at the Met in 2014, mere hours before the U.S. carried out airstrikes against ISIS targets in Syria. In the following year, ISIS would continue to destroy numerous artifacts and archaeological sites, including the historic city of Palmyra. A number of cultural heritage organizations have responded to this immeasurable loss, including the Institute for Digital Archaeology, an organization shared between Harvard and Oxford with the collaboration of UNESCO and the Dubai Future Foundation. In contrast to the handcrafted sculptures that make up the invisible enemy should not exist, the IDA's first cultural restitution project was a monumental third scale, one third scale recreation of the triumphal arch of Palmyra. Built in the third century during the reign of Roman Emperor Septimius Severus, the famously gapped tooth original arch was theatrically destroyed by ISIS in August of 2015. The IDA's reconstructed arch showcases a hands-off method of photogrammetry restoration carved completely by a seven axis mechanical arm out of what the organization describes as the quote, same Egyptian marble as the original. In footage of the arch's construction in Carrara, Italy, the computer controlled arm dominates the marble, mechanically stripping away its exterior with a sharpened point that rhythmically moves back and forth while a tool akin to an orthodontist water pick wets the stone. Water and marble dust fly in the air to the hornet-like thrum of the machine. On another section of marble, the arm cleanly shaves away the stone as if it were made of styrofoam to reveal indented palmette ornamentations. The resulting 26,000 pound reconstructed arch was first presented in London's Trafalgar Square in 2016 and has since been shown at New York City Hall, the G7 Summit in Florence, Dubai's World Government Summit, and on the National Mall in Washington, DC. In highlighting the IDA's Arch of Palmyra, my goal is not to undermine the potential usefulness or historical significance of such a project, but rather to call attention to the troubling way that such a literal and mechanized restoration detaches itself from tangible issues of cultural loss. Boris Johnson inadvertently raised this concern moments before the arch was revealed for the first time when he exclaimed, it is with great, great pleasure that I hereby unveil the oldest new structure in the history of this city. With a flourish, the arch's gauzy covering fell away, magically erasing the gap between destroyed ancient artifact and new British monument. Taken out of both its historical and contemporary context and paraded around high power capitals, the new arch disengages from the original arch's erasure and instead becomes a neoliberal signifier for advanced technology and a symbolic triumph over terrorism, utterly indifferent to the Middle East and its people. Coincidentally, Rakowitz's reconstruction of the Lamassu presents another monumental artifact destroyed by ISIS in 2015 that also found itself on display in Trafalgar Square. In contrast to the IDA's attempts to gloss over the complicated losses of war with a sleekly rendered reconstruction, the thousands of carefully cut date syrup cans that make up the colorful Lamassu enact a complex dialogue between the original sculpture and its new manifestation. Facing towards Iraq, the reconstructed Lamassu signals to its ancient Neo-Assyrian ghost, even as its medium belongs to, the, belongs to contemporary and international Middle Eastern communities. As culturally marked materials found in the homes of exiles, immigrants, refugees, and their descendants, the date syrup cans are both valuable and common, remarkable in their international presence and discardable once their contents are consumed. By utilizing materials typically destined for garbage cans and recycling bins to create beautifully wrought surfaces, Rakowitz calls into question traditional notions of what makes an object precious or durable in the face of history. In a kind of endless loop, ephemeral materials have been used have been used to represent an ancient and enduring sculpture that has revealed itself to be more fragile than ever imagined, but perhaps it is not quite so simple. Ultimately, the relationship between the cast off materials, the intricately crafted forms they take, and the artifacts these new sculptures represent introduces a multi-directional play of meaning that renders the invisible enemy 
simultaneously precious and incomplete. The thousands of date syrup cans that texture the hybrid creature add to this tension. While on the one hand they read as durable armor, the disposable quality of the materials also symbolizes the original sculpture's absence. Rakowitz states in one interview, when I began reconstructing artifacts, I had no desire to replicate them with their original materials. I wanted to capture their physical aura, but to declare them spectral presences using discarded materials to invoke their loss. Though Rakowitz here emphasizes loss, collecting food packaging and scraps can also be seen as a positive act of double salvaging of both the lost objects and of the material traces that evidence everyday lives. Like a quilter using fabric from old clothing and scraps, the recycled and reclaimed nature of Rakowitz's patchwork materials resonates with a tradition of gathering and preserving memory through craft. Bell Hooks makes vivid the link between materials and memory when she compares her essay writing to her grandmother's quilting. She notes, to write this piece, I have relied on fragments, bits and pieces of information found here and there, memories of old conversations coming back again and again, memories like reused fabric in a crazy quilt, contained and kept for the right moment. While Rakowitz's fragments of cardboard, newspaper, and cans are less personal and more commercial than a relative's clothing, they are nonetheless material testimony of real lives and histories that positively assert the global presence of Arab and Middle Eastern communities. Much like quilting or writing, his accumulative and laborious process manifests itself in the intricate and repetitive assemblage of the works. As a traditionally significant food of the region, the date syrup cans also traverse historical memory. While the empty tins point to the ongoing contemporary and international consumption of the Iraqi delicacy, Dates were also an important food for the ancient Assyrians of the Lamassu's origin. Rakowitz, explicit, Rakowitz explicitly activates the multi-temporal and global presence of date syrup in his ongoing project Return, in which the artist reopened his grandfather's Brooklyn-based import-export business in an effort to bring Iraqi-labeled dates to America. Like much of Rakowitz's work, the project expanded to include the unexpected social turns that such a straightforward sounding end goal incited. In 2006, after traveling through some of the most unstable parts of Iraq, alongside thousands of Iraqis attempting to flee the war and ensuing sectarian violence, the dates were turned away from Jordan, moved to Syria, flown to Egypt, and then sent to the US, where they remained held in customs until they spoiled. While the dates of, the, of return and the date syrup tins of the Lamassu remind the viewer of the displacement of Iraqi people, the date syrup itself might be seen as an analog for petroleum oil, another sticky, dark liquid exported from Iraq around the world. In this light, the thousands of empty date syrup cans that make up the Lamassu's armor parallel the barrels of Iraqi oil made available on the global market after the invasion of Iraq reminding the viewer of one of the key motivations for the U.S. invasion. Despite the many associations that the medium evokes, the date syrup also remains what it is, a food to be enjoyed. When the Lamassu was first installed on the fourth plinth, Rakowitz sold date cake and his date syrup recipe books from a kiosk across the square. As a material, the date syrup tins create a complex play of meaning that resists the straightforward and digestible narrative of the IDA's Arch of Palmyra. Unlike the falsely timeless Egyptian marble of the replicated arch, the empty date syrup tins are rooted in the present, even while their contents belong to a longer history of consumption and cultural significance. Moreover, while the arch estranges itself from its Middle Eastern heritage altogether, the date syrup cans evoke both the Lamassu's original homeland and the contemporary diaspora of this region's people and culture, creating yet another play between the ancient object and its new incarnation. This multiplicity of meaning is materially expressed by the beautiful and overwhelming repetition of the thousands of flattened, bent, folded, cut, and screwed together cans that texture the creature's flank like fish scales, evoking the thousands of lives that the materials connect with around the world. The Lamassu's material relation to a multitude of histories and interpretations gives us a many-faceted lens 
through which to look at the more intimate objects of the invisible enemy should not exist, which in turn further emphasize the importance of Rakowitz's deliberate and accumulative process. Like the Lamassu, the refashioned artifacts are the exact same size as the ancient objects they replace, even as they radiate with bright colors that diverge from their predecessors. By, by giving each sculpture a visual uniqueness that boldly separates it from the artifact it represents, Rakowitz's sculptures actively slip between temporalities to form a composite of references that privileges both the original object and its new manifestation. The Arabic script and logos that trace th the three-dimensional surfaces of the objects give new depth and detail to the diverse forms. One male figurine wears a flounced skirt made of what appears to be an apricot container cut into intricate pleats, replicating the original texture of the carved limestone while simultaneously leaving the food packaging legible. A final brief comparison of the invisible enemy's smaller reappearances with digitally rendered artifacts further emphasizes the significant role that Rakowitz's craft process and materials play in communicating irreplaceable cultural loss. While most high-tech reconstruction projects remain invested in monumental architectures, the organization Recre focuses on creating virtual records of destroyed artifacts from the Mosul Cultural Museum. The project began as an online platform for crowdsourced photographs of the artifacts before and after the destruction of the museum. As with the IDA, these photographs can then be used to create reconstructions using photogrammetry technology. By combining multiple photographs of the same object taken from different angles, photogrammetry software connects overlapping features to create a three-dimensional virtual texture of the objects. The resulting virtual texture of a destroyed Assyrian lion looks like a skin of latex peeled from the surface of the original sculpture and converted into the texture of stone. In Rakri's online gallery, the model lion is suspended against a dark backdrop and presented in the round so that the viewer can click and drag the virtual object to zoom in and out and spin it around, though in doing so, the line reveals itself to be a one-sided hollow mold. Founders Matthew Vincent and Chance Kuganor readily acknowledge photogrammetry's shortcomings in producing accurate reconstructions, especially when the technology is limited by images that lack controls for color or measurements. Because of the limitations of crowdsourced, crowdsourced photos, they are wary of the potentially misleading aspect of 3D printing, especially its ability to falsify an object's originally, original material. Rather than feeding the photogrammetry data into 3D printers, Rake represents its reconstructions on digital and virtual reality platforms, like their virtual Mosul Museum. Unlike the recreated Arch of Palmyra, whose material construction allows it to masquerade as a replica of the original, the virtual artifacts exist in what Vincent calls a controlled environment whose temporary quality, he hopes, will force viewers to confront the reality of the object's loss when they step away from their screen. However, despite their awareness of the manipulative capacity of digital, of digital archaeology, Vincent and Kuganor maintain that the process of photogrammetry itself is like magic. In doing so, they highlight one of the project's major flaws. While the software's ability to seamlessly combine hundreds of photographs in a hands-off process might be seen as a technological miracle, the resulting digital reconstruction erases the potentially elucidating accumulative and human process that made its creation possible. Detached from the original crowdsourced photos, the digital reconstructions exist wholly out of time and place and are reduced only to their static skin-like state. By rendering an additive process invisible through its material result, the virtual artifacts fail to meaningfully communicate the ongoing play of meaning and cultural memory that Rakowitz's crafted artifacts embody. In direct contrast to these digital reconstructions, the crafted sculptures that make up the invisible enemy should not exist, visually announce their accumulative and laborious process of making through their composite and patched together surfaces. At the same time, Rakowitz's use of simultaneously disposable and culturally significant materials gives the new objects a deliberately multivalent presence that allows them to toggle between associations 
locations, and time periods. The resulting reconstructions remain intentionally caught between ancient artifact and new, and new creation, leaving the viewer forever questioning the mysterious but profound historical weight of the works. Rooted in the past, but definitively of the present, the crafted sculptures are held in temporal suspense, forever waiting for, for the return of the original objects and for their own manifestation as a total archive of missing artifacts to be complete. As an archive whose goal is to communicate an irretrievable absence larger than the sum of its parts, the invisible enemy should not exist, remains ongoing, additive, and like its own craft process and materials, infinitely in the making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eliza, for this very rich presentation, which um, sort of, as I hear you, I, I have a list of questions um, to discuss. Hopefully, you know, we will have time after our second presentation for uh, questions and also questions from our lovely audience who are uh, watching, you know, the, these presentations, the vocabulary to talk about how today's uh, you know, uh, presentations go are kind of weird. But please, if you have any questions, make sure to uh, send them through the chat. I would like now to um, uh, introduce our second speaker uh, and our next paper. Um, Ava Huss is a PhD student in art history at the University of California, um, UCLA, where she focuses on the arts of Southwest Asia and North Africa. I do very much um, uh, appreciate the uh, the specific, the definition of um, the identity of Southwest Asia, by the way. Um, Ava will be presenting her paper, They Destroy, We Rebuild, Unsettling Syrian Heritage in the American Museum. Thank you. Ava, floor is yours. Thank you, Nada, and thank you for everyone who made this possible, despite all of the obstacles of 2020. Um, I'm just trying to get my screen up. Okay. So in the wake of September 11th, American museums sought to counter rising levels of Islamophobia through the increased inclusion of Islamic art in their exhibition programming. This phenomenon has been well documented by cultural critics and scholars who have helped uncover a paradox in the apparently liberal agenda of many such museum displays. Anthropologist Jessica Winnegar, for example, has looked to case studies ranging from exhibitions, film screenings, and musical performances to show how their visual and textual presentations inadvertently reinforced the rhetoric of the war on terror, even when their organizing institutions explicitly opposed its military campaigns. 10 years after September 11th marked the beginning of Syria's ongoing civil war. And since 2011, presentations of Syrian art, both historical and contemporary, have proliferated in cultural institutions across the US. Today, I'll be looking at three examples of museum initiatives that contextualize their programming within the crises of war, destruction, and displacement unfolding in current day Syria. Each case study focuses on a different city, Palmyra, Damascus, and Aleppo, within a different time period, ancient, modern, and contemporary or future. Despite these differences, a common thread uniting them is that they are all projects of spatial reconstruction. And as such, I have taken the opportunity to put them into conversation with the sculptural reappearings of Michael Rakowitz. Discourses surrounding Syrian heritage today take up the displacement or destruction of material culture, as well as the dis displacement and resettlement of people. But the artistic interventions of a figure like Rakowitz warn us against simply collapsing the two. It is in this spirit that I turn to these discrepant discourses of displacement the multiplicities they contain and the uneven consequences they carry to ask what underlying assumptions about heritage and its loss we might uncover by interrogating their modes of display and narrative representation. Rakowitz's series, The Invisible Enemy Should Not, Be, Should Not Exist, speculatively reimagines lost objects and monuments like those looted from the National Museum of Iraq after the US invasion or demolished by ISIS at Assyrian archeological sites. Relief sculptures from the Northwest Palace at Nimrud reappear in splendid color through the use of contemporary everyday materials like Arabic language newspapers and remnants of food packaging. And, and as we saw from Eliza's presentation, there is much to be unpacked uh, about this series, but here I want to foreground only one aspect 
as it relates to my first case study, and that is how Rakowitz's conspicuous use of modern consumer materials directs our attention to a complex and ongoing relationship between the region's ancient past and its inhabitants today. In 2017, the same year that Rakowitz's palace reliefs were first exhibited, the Getty Research Institute published its first digital exhibition. The Legacy of Ancient Palmyra takes a look at the historic city from the first to third centuries through the eyes of Europeans who traveled there much later. The exhibition pairs two archives from, from the GRI's permanent collection, etchings made by the architect Louis-François de Sauce in the 1700s, and photographs taken by Louis Vigne in 1864. Both depict the sites of Palmyra and former states of preservation, and their juxtaposition intends to help the viewer mentally reconstruct what the ancient city might have looked like. In reading the Getty exhibition against the work of Brakowitz, I suggest that it reflects an attempt, however unintentionally, to distance Palmyra's heritage from the Arab people who have lived there for centuries. The exhibition marks the first time that images from the glass plates made by Wien, which are the first known photographs of Palmyra, have ever been published. His compositions deliberately avoid the inclusion of figures, which was typical of 19th century Orientalist documentation of historic sites and landscapes in the Middle East. For the close observer, however, evidence of the site's active use by local populations inadvertently betrays Palmyra's long history of displacement. And if you look closely at these images, you can see a mud brick village that's been built into the sanctuary courtyard of the Temple of Bel. The accompanying texts acknowledge the presence of, of the dwellings in the images, but refrain from telling the history of their Arab residents, who spoke a dialect related to ancient Palmyrene and lived there until forcefully relocated by French archaeologists between 1929 and 1932. By overlooking the European-driven displacement of local communities, the exhibition's narrative divorces the concept of Syria as a place from that of a people with a right to self-determination and legitimate claims to the land. Instead, it communicates an impression of Palmyra as an, as an uninhabited and even underappreciated place waiting for its rediscovery by the Occident. Unlike these deep, depopulated scenes, the etchings of Kassas often include figures and many of them. His etchings of Palmyra fall roughly into two categories. The first focuses, focuses on the ruins as they existed during his own travels and include depictions of Bedouins he supposedly encountered. Rendered with dark beards, stocky bodies, and voluptuous heavy clothing, the figures are mostly sedentary, gathered together densely under crumbling walls. In striking contrast, the second category of prints reimagines the ancient city in its heyday, where fair figures wear light, billowy clothing, emphasizing their movement and buoyancy. The process of archaeological fantasy at work here locates Palmyra squarely within the classical world of Greco-Roman antiquity that Europe claims as its civilizational inheritance. The rupturing between past and present in the work of Kassas constitutes yet another way of obscuring the possible connections between Syria's ancient civilizations and its modern inhabitants. It is the reverse of the rupturing maneuver at play in Rakowitz's sculptures, where the past is brought into the present and vice versa through the unexpected play on materials. The Getty exhibition might have been an opportunity to reflect critically on the bodies of work produced by Kassas and Bean as a way to discuss representational strategies used by Europeans in the Middle East in the 18th and 19th centuries. Instead, the exhibition attempts to sanitize the history of Palmyra's excavation from its colonial roots reproducing the Orientalist legacy of those credited with Palmyra's rediscovery rather than interrogating it. From its first sentence, quote, in this 21st century, war in Syria has irrevocably changed the ancient caravan city of Palmyra. The exhibition stresses the place and structures rather than the millions of human lives irrevocably changed by violence. Winnegar's scholarship reminds us to stay vigilant about how cultural programming can contribute to government rhetoric and foreign policy. A striking example is, um, it is an exhibition at the Met that included objects from Syrian archaeological sites and whose opening in 2014 was used as a platform by then Secretary of State John Kerry to argue for military intervention into Syria. One journalist noted Kerry's speech as being, quote, striking for its emphasis on the threat to cultural heritage over the threat to human lives, a description equally applicable to the Gettys ex exhibition. 
Both are beholden to an anachronistic preoccupation with the loss of material culture and the West's role in saving this at-risk heritage, rather than offering a perspective in which the fate of people and material culture are inextricably intertwined. Shifting from a virtual reconstruction to a literal one, this case study presents the strange path of migration made by a period room that is now in the permanent collection of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. This section is informed by a process of geopolitical mapping central to Rakowitz's work, one reluctantly engaged or sometimes obscured by museums. Mounted on the fourth plinth of London's Trafalgar Square in 2018, Rakowitz's Lamassu was constructed out of 10,500 date syrup cans whose former contents were produced in Iraq and exported through Lebanon by way of Syria. Their colorful presence makes visible the historical contingencies of geography, an environment ravaged by war and imperialism, and the bureaucratic hurdles involved in circumventing sanctions against Iraq, which Rakowitz details on his blog. His transparency around the transportation of materials signals the regulations that govern movements across borders, as well as the ways works of art participate in complex networks of financial and diplomatic relations. The Damascus Room's journey begins in the 1760s in Northern Damascus, where it was used to receive honored guests in an elite Ottoman era home. In 1978, the historic house was demolished to make way for a new road, and the room's interior was dismantled and sent to a storage warehouse in Beirut. There, its painted and carved wooden paneling, stone floors, and fountain were preserved under layers of dust until 2012, when they were acquired through an auction in London by LACMA's Islamic art curator, Linda Komarov. The room then traveled to Los Angeles to undergo a three-year process of restoration, during which it was never seen by the public. It was instead in Dharhan, Saudi Arabia, where it was first mounted on metal armature and unveiled in 2019. It remains housed there today at Ithra, a new cultural institution developed and funded by the national oil company, Saudi Aramco, which also financed the room's conservation in LA. Tracking the Damascus room's movements uncovers the sophisticated choreography required between nations, public institutions, and private companies to preserve this piece of Syrian heritage. But LACMA's public communications invariably emphasize certain legs of the room's journey over others. As the public's interlocutor, Kamaroff uses the first in a series of museum blog posts about the room to discuss how Syria's uncertain political situation changed the meaning and value of collecting Syrian art. Focusing on its movement from Syria to California, she writes, Quote, the notion that we would be helping to preserve a small part of the cultural history of one of the world's oldest continuously occupied cities intensified my interest in bringing the room to Los Angeles so that its story can be told and appreciated in this 21st century city. The urgent need for preservation in Komarov's account also provides a possible motivation to what would become an unusual partnership between a public museum in the US and a foreign business entity rather than another nonprofit. From 2015 to 2017, the museum discuss, discussed its partnership with Ithra in positive terms, but this spoken enthusiasm seems to have waned in recent years as mentions of the room's continued presence in Saudi Arabia became less frequent. In 2018, responding to mounting public pressure after the assassination of journalist Jamal Khashoggi, a number of institutions publicly announced they were no longer accepting Saudi funding for Middle Eastern related programming. LACMA did not make the same commitment, though perhaps its silence serves in part to publicly distance itself from its Saudi connections. In today's shifting political landscape, museums might foreground an awareness of current events to affirm their relevance, or at other times, they might conceal their own vested interests towards the same ends. The room's physical displacement is positioned between a museum rhetoric that appeals on the one hand to a salvage paradigm, not unlike that of the Gettys, and to the liberal views of its museum audience on the other. In her final blog post from 2015, Kamaroff writes of the effects that harrowing political realities have on the individual experience of art, and to paraphrase um, how the joy and comfort of physically being in the Damascus room is tempered by the sadness of the continuing deterioration of daily life in Syria. A considerable, shift, a considerable shift can be felt from the anonymous voice of the Palmyra Project to the curatorial subjectivity of Kamarov's affective response. And the post also manifests a conceptual and literal effort to make Syrian bodies present in the staging of the room 
through the accompanying video of a Syrian American artist who recites a poem while sitting within it, evoking the recent displacement of Syrians from their own homes. Komarov concludes by referencing the room's role as a preserver of memories of Syria. But as we've seen, the room also has various roles to play in cultural diplomacy, institutional funding, and connecting with the public's concerns around a growing refugee crisis. The figure of the refugee appears most prominently in the third and final case study, the 2016 exhibition Future Aleppo at Museum, a small cultural institution in lower Manhattan that consists of two converted freight elevator shafts. Lit and visible both day and night to passersby, it presented a single object, a four foot by four foot model of a city made out of hand colored cardboard whose ephemeral qualities share certain resonances with Rakowitz's own sculptures. A five minute film by a Syrian citizen journalist was what first gave museum director Alex Kalman the idea for the exhibition. The film follows Mohammed Kutesh, a young boy living in war-torn Aleppo. From the ages of 10 to 13, Kutesh used a neighbor's abandoned, abandoned apartment as a studio to construct his architectural models, which include his favorite buildings and recently destroyed ones. Aleppo's iconic medieval citadel is reconstructed in whole rather than in the reality of its collapsed form, resulting from clashes between al-Assad's forces and the Free Syri Syrian Army in 2012. Neither these nor ISIS are mentioned by the museum texts, which follow in the spirit of the Syrian filmmaker's own voice. The last shot of the film serves as a kind of motto for the project as a whole. It shows a small note pinned above Patasha's work desk that reads in handwritten Arabic, they destroy, we rebuild. Here, the ambiguity of the pronouns allows us to understand that while the identity of they, the destroyers, might change, the collective courage to rebuild and persevere remains. As its title suggests, the exhibition Future Aleppo prefers to focus on the optimism shown by Syrian youth in the face of present hardships. And Patasha's models reflect ideas for his city's imagined future, replete with gardens, amusement parks, and solar paneling. Against all odds, the delicate model made the 6,000 mile journey from Aleppo to New York City and now continues to travel around the world to venues like the Skirball Center in Los Angeles, the v &A in London, and Arc Des in Stockholm. The exhibition's grand tour is surprising given the particularities of museum as a tiny institution less bound to the conventions of more established ones. Referring to it tongue in cheek as a contemporary natural history or archeology span museum, its director advocates for a curatorial style he calls object journalism, exemplified by exhibits displaying personal items found at the US-Mexican border, the inventions of inmates at Rikers, and packaging from fake American fast food chains in Iran, and other quotidian objects from different wakes of contemporary life. By looking to Syrian voices to propel the narrative rather than act as a framing device, Future Aleppo offers a timely countermodel or provocation to institutions of a different museological scale. To be tenable in other contexts, this approach to exhibition planning requires not only imagination, but also a willingness to share platforms and material opportunities, as suggested by a New York Times opinion piece co-authored by Kalman and Patesh. Rakowitz also engages this collaborative spirit, both in the production of artworks, which Eliza also discussed in her presentation, um, but also in his use of art spaces to bring people together through communal dinners, workshops, and classes, events that not only provide opportunities for celebration or reflection, but also crucially involve financially supporting refugee or migrant communities and industries. Future Aleppo's display, display was also used as a means to fundraise for the Fetish's, for the Fetish family, who by then had to relocate to Turkey. Where future Aleppo may not differ as much from the previous case studies is in the great care and effort taken to relocate a piece of material heritage. That the cardboard model crossed so many hands, currencies, and borders to arrive at its final destination bespeaks the great tragedy and the mobility of art, but not people, to make such moves. It is unclear to what degree the exhibition or money raised can truly change the circumstances of the Pateish family who continue to seek a way to leave Turkey or the lives of more than 13 million displaced Syrians. The programmatic goals of museum are humanistic, using art to inspire compassion and the belief that creativity and hope are shared across humanity. 
Under this universalizing message, on the other hand, is also a story of exceptionalism. Teacher Aleppo emphasizes one child's aspirations of becoming an architect, a dream that is secular and palatable in different ways to Western audiences and to their government to make decisions about who to let in. By way of a conclusion, I'd like to return to analyses of post 9-11 museum displays and to what art historian Barry Flood has characterized as the exhibitionary regime that emerged in the following decade. If secular institutions then faced increasing pressures to quote, locate and provide an appropriate model of Islam, then now in the context of the Syrian war, these pressures become those of locating the right kind of material heritage and modeling the right kind of refugee. The hesitancy on behalf of museums to reckon with the troubling legacies of imperialism suggests we look to how such lines of inquiry are taken up by an artist like Rakowitz, who not only interrogates the intersections of art and violent conflict, but is also acutely attuned to the exhibitionary regimes in which his own work circulates. Materially embedded within his artworks is an awareness of the political conditions and personal connections that make their own production and display possible. His work also disrupts the act of viewing itself by inviting us to quote, partake with all our senses in physical manifestations of what can otherwise appear distant abstract issues as noted by Nasher curator, Catherine Kraft. What can these artistic interventions bring to bear for art historians and curators who specialize in regions whose people and material, uh, sorry, specialize in regions whose people and material heritage have been and continue to be unsettled? How, how might they in turn unsettle the way we view dichotomies between destroying and building or between us and them? As our world grows increasingly displaced, the rate at which museums are responding to global events gains speed. This new speed brings a greater urgency to the task of understanding and challenging the relationship between art discourses, methods of display, and modes of knowledge production. But here, I hope to suggest that the work of contemporary artists can inform not only how we read exhibitions, but also how we choose to imagine the possibilities for their future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ava. I think actually both um, Eliza's and Ava's uh, paper uh, papers bring open up um, the possibility for a number of questions, and I have to say that I'm going to start with um, one of my own before I go to um, audiences um, uh, questions because of if something that is very dear to me in my own work that I can see still absence even in the the. Excellent examples uh, and discussion that you uh, presented, uh, particularly, you know, when we're looking at the ancient as represented um, through the project, through exhibitions, through the photos of uninhabited sort of, you know, distant um, uh, humanities heritage, um, devoid of the Arab inhabitants or Arab identity, let's say, uh, specifically, which, yes, we see that come back in the choice of material um, by uh, Rakowitz. But even when the projects do want to bring in um, the contemporary, they bring in refugees, right? So people in distress. That bypasses a whole chunk of history of, you know, the modern and the contemporary, which is of achievement, not just destruction. I would like to hear from uh, both of you of how you think, or, you know, what do you think um, uh, the possibility of, uh, I mean, A, why? I mean, which I, I can probably kind of guess, uh, given your papers, why you think that is. But how do we bring this as part of this? I am always um, very um, uh, uh, concerned about that absence of, the you know we we're jumping from ancient to contemporary refugees, but we're missing this whole sort of you know richness of heritage, which is the modern um, uh, period, the national period, which where the Arab identity is even represented more. I'd like to hear your thoughts about this, um, and we can just go in the same order of representation. Um, uh, Eliza, you can start, and then Eva, you can uh, follow. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Donna. That's a really, really interesting point. And I, I was thinking about that as, as I was working through this presentation about, um, 
you know, that there is this really interesting temporal slippage between Rakowitz's um, works and this ancient past and um, how there is like this sort of ping pong that skips over maybe a lot of um, what you're talking about, the modern um, Arab world. And um, I think it's something I want to think more about. I think part of what I think is so beautiful about Rakowitz's work is that um, some of the materials like the date syrup and the food um, can really get at um, different time periods in ways that perhaps the ancient objects that um, were also fixated on both in archaeology, art history, um, and like in their contemporary destruction, perhaps those materials can get us beyond that to think more about um, other materials that might be less valued, but uh, more elucidating of a sort of um, more general culture or uh, yeah, modern culture. Um, yeah, I don't know if Ava has, if you have different thoughts. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And I guess it would, I mean, it would depend probably on the representation that we're um, talking about. I would imagine that for certain museum exhibitions or presentations, and there would be kind of this hesitancy to bring in more modern periods because it's harder not to talk about colonialism in those contexts than it is if you're talking about ancient and to contemporary. Um, but something else that I think maybe we didn't have the time to get into as much in our presentations, but the, the kind of like color and the playfulness and the almost like irreverent humor that uh, Rakowitz has in his work, I think is really central to this because it kind of forces us to reckon with these um, feelings of loss and grief, but all, at the same time enjoyment, whether it's like sensual enjoyment of an object or a food um, and Put it, and also humor and the absurdity of all of it. And I think putting that all together in, in one is really unique and kind of, again, like forces the viewer to, to sit with those emotions and, and kind of reflect on it um, in a way that sticks with you more. So I, I, that's more about his work and how it kind of brings that all together. But he's, he is kind of bringing in, I think, these positive aspects of accomplishment along with loss in, in a single object. No, I, I absolutely agree with uh, with both of you. And in fact, you know, um, through invoking this the Arabic text um, and you know even specific aspects of production, it opens up spaces for you know looking into deeper into maybe lost on the the viewer. And, you know, the immediacy of it is lost on the viewer, but it certainly allows for that way more than the other examples of um, that you, you showed through uh, your work, which also kind of brings me to the issue of how can we as scholars um, reconcile the idea of loss and reconstruction, both sort of, you know, um, uh, performed, let's say, by uh, pretty much the same powers, right? I mean, you know, the examples of the museums, these are, you know, we're, we're looking at Western museums and their conception of um, uh, reconstruction, which is, again, taken from that point of view of um, humanity's heritage. It's our duty. It's our own. And as uh, I've uh, sort of uh, uh, alluded to, this connection to the Greco-Roman, so really placing it, positioning it in, in our heritage. And of course, the example of Boris uh, uh, Johnson, you know, um, uh, speech and, and example, I mean, that's um, classic colonial um, uh, uh, sort of, you know, representation. But how can we um, you know, how can we reconcile those as we move forward in um, in our work in general? I don't know if you've had any sort of thoughts on that. And I have then a following uh, question from the audience that kind of connects to it uh, further um, that perhaps I will also, for the sake of time, put on, on the table for both of you to consider, uh, which is that the exhibitions and reconstructions under discussion in both papers have largely been made for and seen by Western audiences. How might we begin to reimagine exhibitions about cultural loss and restitution in the countries where these events have occurred or for an audience comprised of their citizens? Can Eliza, you can start. Sure. Um, I might need you to read out the second question again, but I think, um, and this is just actually came from Ava's um, beautiful presentation, which I so enjoyed listening to. 
Um, but I love the phrase that you use, uh, speculatively reimagine. And I think that it's, it's so powerful because it, it's like what needs to be done is to reimagine from both a place, a personal place and a historical place. And sort of, I think, seeing where those things overlap, which I think is what draws a lot of us to Rakowitz's work, um, that it is both so historical, but also, um, so far reaching and outwardly focused as well. Um, and yeah, so looking at these speculative reimaginations that can um, tie in these, both the historical and the personal, I think is what I would say. And then I might need you to repeat the second question after. Sure, do you, Eva, do you wanna say something before I repeat the second question? Sure, um, yeah, I mean, I think just in terms of this reckoning between loss and reconstruction, it's a really difficult question or challenge for us. And I think one of the, besides this kind of like reimagining um, process that we also need to bring in a kind of like critical reflexivity that uh, into the presentations of our scholarship and, um, you know, exhibitions or artworks too. And I think that's another way in which looking to the work of an artist like Rakowitz can kind of help inform academic or curatorial research as well. And I, I should say that both of your presentations do bring that criticality. And, you know, that that why it, it you know, puts that question very much on the surface. And so let me let me uh, read the second question again. We just have a few minutes to um, respond to this. It's about the exhibitions and reconstructions under discussion um, in both papers that have um, are sort of, you know, um, uh, organized mostly for Western audience. The question is, how might we begin to reimagine exhibitions about cultural loss and restitution in the countries where these events have occurred or for an audience comprised of their citizens? And again, keeping in mind that by the we will be sort of the Western powers, because this is how it seems to, like these projects are funded, even if it's funded by, let's say, you know, Ithra and Saudi Arabia. Again, you know, it's, it's coming from a position of power, let's say. Yeah. yeah. No, you, start. you start. Go for it. I was just going to say, I think that's a huge challenge, especially when we're talking about um, places that are currently in the midst of crisis. You know, I mean, it. The, the thought of sending an exhibition of Syrian art to Syria is sort of like impossible for us to imagine in, cer in certain situations. And I think that there has to be kind of um, a real sensitivity there between like what art institutions can and should be doing and how they choose to like spend their resources. I mean, Ithra was one example of, um, you know, that's been kind of presented as sending objects of Islamic art because the Damascus room is actually part of a larger exhibition that went to Ithra of Islamic, of LACMA's permanent Islamic art collection. And I think a large part of that was sending it to a different audience um, who has like connections to Islamic art in different ways than maybe a Western audience would. Um, but it still doesn't really, again, there are within the Middle East or West Asia or whatever we want to call it, there are very different kinds of um, relations of power that have to be taken into consideration. And I think it can't just be kind of like a PR campaign for the museum to say, we've done, we've taken this back to where it's from. And um, it has to kind of be, uh, again, done more critically and with more of an awareness of what it means on the, on the ground where it is. Yeah, and I think just building on that, um, maybe like applying some of Rakowitz's own interest in site specificity um, to those projects and the attention that needs to be given um, to a specific site and um, a specific location and incorporating the voices of the people in that location, I think would be crucial. Yep, and I would just say um, as in, in closing, um, as we are out of time, that perhaps more connections, more collaborations with the inside. So for example, in 2003, after the invasion and the destruction of the uh, Museum of Modern Art in Baghdad, Iraqi artists mounted an exhibition on the, the, you know, the destroyed site of the museum. In itself, you know, the act of, while, you know, things are unsettled, was a, an act of defiance, but it also kind of showed that um, 
that it's a living space, that it's not, you know, a destroyed distance sort of something, even though the world was at the time very busy with the ancient night, you know, I mean, correctly so, I'm not disputing that, but the, the, the Museum of Modern Art was hardly ever um, discussed or, you know, uh, talked about until today. And it's looted collection, you know, now by now kind of is sort of hopeless to, to, um, um, uh, to even get it back, um, which is, again, based on that concept of, of absence and distance because uh, it is a living, you know, modern contemporary moment. There's um, lots of topics that we can, um, I'm sure, talk about more, and hopefully all of our um, audience and participants will be back on, uh, I mean, tomorrow for our third session, but also then on Friday for our uh, roundtable discussion with all of our uh, presenters and their wonderful papers. Thank you very much, Eliza and Ava, for a very rich, um, beautiful, you know, papers. I was very much enjoyed uh, hearing them. And to our audiences and everyone watching us, thank you very much for being here and we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.